what a what a great fit for uh, and a great thing this morning. Alicia Rubin got up here, gave some announcements, and then proceeded to cause many of you to rebel fully. And I thought you were going to run up on stage, grab her, yank her out of here because she said, "Go Chiefs!" Right? Yeah. You're lucky that you didn't get attacked. It's perfect because we're going to see that experience in the scripture today in the city of Ephesus. We're entering into a season talking about Ephesians, all right? Um, and so we're going we're gonna to today, I'm going to read a bunch of story um, from Ephesians, the end of 18, chapter 19, and then a, a great speech that Paul gives the writer of Ephesians in uh, chapter 20, a portion of that. So a bunch of scripture today. Get your Bibles out. Open up the phones online, in your bed, getting ready for the game, like the 10,000 pregame things that are going on. If you're online watching live right now, grab your Bible, whatever, and uh, it'll also be on the screen, all right? We want to encourage you when you find something great in the Word of God, circle it, highlight it, man, write around it. I circle a lot, underline a lot, so that when I go back, I just see kind of what God has been saying, all right? There is this clash going on. So we're talking about a clash of cultures over the coming weeks, a crash, a collision of two things com combining with one another, hitting one another, crashing into each other, and kind of what happens as a result of that. That's what Paul's going to write about. Now, today is a perfect picture of that, not just what you almost did to Alicia up here, but in these two teams, the Niners and the Chiefs, right? That's who's playing today, correct? That hurt your Niner fans, huh? All right. Uh, there is going to be, you could say, two cultures colliding. The, cult, the coaches of that team have created cultures of their team. There's going to be stories of different players and how they're, they're kind of going up against one another. And you're going to see this clash, this crash, coming together, culminating in a, in a game. People are going to gather, go nuts. You're going to at home, eat a ton of food, stuff that they're going to just pay for on Monday morning, right? Just why did I even do that? It's because it's the game. It's, it's, a, it's a clash also of, I guess, your mouth and your stomach coming together in a horrible, I don't know, that's probably a lot of you will experience. So it, it's, this, it's this crash together. I um, have seen it, I was just talking with uh, some folks from the church that in March will head out to uh, an incredible tour in the Middle East. And I've been, many of you know, some of you have gone with me probably now 25, 30 years, probably 30 plus times to Israel, Jordan, um, a little bit, and, and other places here and there. But my main experiences have been in Jordan. Talk about a clash, a crash, a collision of cultures. Man, I have experienced rocks being thrown at me on the Temple Mount. Um, you know, we were there one of our trips Man, when uh, all the whole Lebanon and Israel thing collided, rockets shooting to places that we were just staying at. We're there in the midst of this grand, great, crazy, sad, broken collision of cultures and people, beliefs and religions. You see that when we went up on the Temple Mount. You just see it's just anger, bitterness, fear, just all that it creates. When cultures clash like that, when you have this collision, it's going to create. We'll look at it in a little bit. We're going to really go through a bunch of things, come to a conclusion of three points I want you to think about for the series. But it creates confusion, conflict, challenges. Just It does that. Now, to take it a little deeper, it does that in church. So when we have religious collisions, cultures clashing and colliding together, it brings up many things. We have it right now. Man, I do not want to get into anything today with it, but that in the political world. Go to the news every day. In this room right here, if we brought up parties, beliefs, some of you would walk out the door mad and angry and not stay and come ever again because suddenly you didn't like what was said about what you believed or who you liked. Talk about a collision. Go to whatever news channel you want. Every hour, not every day, every hour. And there is a clash of politics, belief systems, 
structures that have been created and then just stuff that most of us go what what are we living in right here i can't believe it well you can even even have a collision when you think that you know chick-fil-a is not the best uh chicken sandwich right and suddenly you're like you know it's when in and out came there was a fight over what hamburger is the best in the valley and people are taking sides and you know and yet you want to talk about a collision of i don't know if it's culture but whatever it is drive by chick-fil-a right now right i had i finally got in because they sent me listen they sent me free uh, in an email that i get eight nuggets for free and on friday it was going to end. So at 10, I even know the time of day when this happened. At 10, 24, there was no one in line in the drive through And I was driving by. You know what I did? I zipped right around there, and I pulled in that drive through And I went up, and I said, give me a spicy chicken sandwich. My eight, I emphasize free nuggets. And you know what? Just throw in some waffle fries as well. And you know what she told me? Still breakfast. We can't do that. <laughs> you need to wait six minutes. And I said, okay, I'm just, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And she said, you got to wait six minutes, but not here. <laughs> so I had to drive out, get close enough to block people off so they didn't take my spot in six minutes and I went back in and I said at, I mean at 10 30 give me my nuggets my fry you know and, okay <laughs> there was almost a clash through the the talky thing right <laughs> when Jesus came into my life in the fourth grade, it took a lot of ups and downs for me to get to a place where I fully embraced his call. And even today, I still have ups and downs. Um, and his transformed life that he offers me, this new identity that he gives. But when I, with some little beautiful old ladies at Evans Valley Elementary School down in the cafeteria, when they showed me the colors, told me that I am, my heart is black as sin, and the red blood of Jesus, you know, forgave my sin, and you can have this new white life, you know, of uh, this color of purity, and then I can go to heaven, streets of gold, and the green of growth. And when I did that, followed that little color um, picture, and I went, I want to receive Jesus. I didn't know what I was doing exactly. The moment I did that, now at 56 for all those years, it has created a collision, a crash of culture in my life that has brought a lot of conflict and change within family, you could say, within job, within friends, within the neighborhood wow for me big time because of being a pastor within the church and every week especially in my vocation I clash and we uh, crash into one another people do because of my beliefs and what's more it does it in my own life last week for example we talked about giving I'm not talking about giving today but I know some because I talked to a couple people just talking about the grip that money has on our hearts and souls created a collision of beliefs. Many of us want to hold on tightly to something we feel that maybe Jesus is asking us to give up. I have that still in my life. The moment I read his word or I hear his voice or I respond, whatever, even today in worship, there is a collision, a, a, a clash of dark and light coming together do i believe this do i receive this who what is my identity 
who am I? It's like the little devil and angel on your shoulder yelling, you are no good, you are evil, man, you are a sinner, man, God does not like you. And over here, it's like, no, God loves you. God has forgiven you. God has showed you grace. He, he died for you. Right? Wow. That's there constantly. In the city of Ephesus, when we go to the book of Acts, you can go to chapter 18. In the book of Acts, we see this collision come to a head. Now, it has happened in the growth of the church so far. But in 18, we're going to pick that up in just a minute, not yet. But let me just tell you a little bit of what's going on uh, in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is like a doorway to the world in the Middle East. Many cultures and people and beliefs are in the city. It's very fast growing. Um, and many people, because it's, uh, you know, the, the nature of what it is, it's, they're coming in and out. So it's a very diverse community city. They're coming and going. They have great influence over economy, politics, religion, and beliefs. And in the city, where it's going to collide even more is in the religious world. There were over, they believe, 50 different gods. Um, and in that, there were all sorts of beliefs. So they were combining all sorts of beliefs together, cultic things and adding to it. And, you know, there was just a, a, a big old, you know, pot of all sorts of things mixed up together at times as well. Now, what, what we'll see in our story today is there is one prominent God you will see named Artemis, and you will also see named Diana. Uh, and she was the most prominent. Uh, a grand temple was there that's massive and huge. She had a large, large following. Her cult uh, influenced the entire city, whether you fully believed in her or not. Uh, so much so that many people believe she held the greatest power, and she was often spoken of, this is interesting, as the queen of heaven, and even at times, Lord and Savior. Well, when Jesus enters in to town through many of the missionary work that Paul and Peter and people were doing, Jesus comes into town. Talk about a clash, a collision of cultures. Here is this queen of heaven, Lord and Savior, and now here is the Lord and Savior of the way, they call that group, coming in, and it was creating great turmoil. As people begin to follow Christ, the, the church is growing quickly. Um, it's impacting all facets of life, and people are becoming Christians, and it's not only changing then their life, but the life of the community around them. I mean, this is like how Christianity should be 101, right? This is the beginning. It should create a clash, a collision, Challenges and changes, even conflict. Jesus would speak of that. Hey, I didn't come to just bring all peace and happiness. I did, but that's for the soul and heart. There's going to be conflict as these cultures collide. It's going to create issues and problems. So it's happening in the city. It should do that. Uh, how we respond to it needs to be corrected and changed in our world today, but it should do that in culture, right? It should do that in our community. We said last week and the weeks before, because of our loving, serving, and giving, this should be a mark of us. You know, I don't like what they believe, those Christians, but man, I cannot take away the fact that they love, serve, and give like nobody else. Oh, it creates some big problems. They are giving up their former way of life. Idols, false religions, we'll see that in part of the story. Those in authority are concerned about these changes in the people and the city that Christianity is creating, their greatest concern really is all about control and power. And you see that even today. We'll see that here. I don't think it's changed in 2,000 years. Why? Because the spiritually dark and sinful culture is colliding with the light of Jesus as lives are being transformed through the gospel. Now, you see this beginning in Acts 18. Go there. This is verse 24 through 26. All right? Meanwhile, this is the beginning of some work in Ephesus. 
This is the start of something that God is doing. Great. All right? Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well. So he has great knowledge. He had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He finds Christ probably in Egypt. He travels to Ephesus. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and accuracy. So he's enthusiastic. He's accurate in what he knows. However, he only knew about John's baptism. And this is kind of a big deal going throughout scriptures. This is what John said. Um, you know, repent, get baptized in water, and then go live this life. It's all about more the religious aspect in the beginning there. But he did not know, as we continue on, he only knew about John's baptism, but he doesn't know about Jesus, really. I mean, he does not enough. Not what Jesus can do in a transformed life. So there's an aspect that he's missing, an experience that he needs to have. So go, go back. You were good. Um, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. So one of the things that will happen is when you, because here's what I want to happen to people that don't know Jesus. One of our main goals, our missions, is for people to find Jesus. Journey Church, we want you, help you find Jesus. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't follow him, have a relationship with him, I am telling you, one of the first things that I want to challenge you to do, one of the ways we're going to give more money to, hire more people for, man, provide more experiences in, is so that people can find Jesus. That's one. Two is to help you follow him, be formed into the likeness of him, but that's for people that are saved. We want you to find Jesus. When, if you're here today and you say, you know what, I don't fully understand everything, but I know this, I need to get saved. My, my life is destroyed. I feel lost, lonely, whatever it is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. You don't fully know everything. We get that. We got to help you with that. But you know enough to say, this matters. It's going to make a difference. I need this. I told you I did that in the fourth grade. I don't fully know what you're saying. I know my grandma's been praying for this. I realize I need Jesus. Help me find Jesus. But I didn't know a whole lot. I didn't hardly know anything. So sometimes you need people to come alongside you. You can't fully get it on Sundays. If you think on just Sundays, coming here once in a while is going to feed you to the extent that you can flourish the way God has asked you to do, it's foolishness. We need more than that. You've got to learn some of that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But to find Jesus and begin this journey, ah, that's awesome, right? You need people to help you walk with you through this. So this is a promo for small groups. I know I worked all that 10, I got 26 minutes left. Man, join a small group. Joanne back there at the meeting has got a women's group on one of the evenings this week. We've got some other women's groups meeting. Men's groups, I have one on Thursday mornings. There's still one group open that's a mixed group. A bunch of people gather together. It's available to you. There's young adult groups, married or not. Um, there is Celebrate Recovery if you need help with some of your issues and problems and struggles that we all kind of deal with in some way. There's a senior adult group that meets. One of the things that happens in a small group is you get to have more of an investment concerning your spiritual growth in Jesus. Because you can't get it all here. Important Sundays, gathering, rubbing up against one another, all that stuff, yes. But you need more. We'll see that. So, in 18, this happens. Jesus begins to spread through this guy, but then two people come along and say, we're going to help you with this. And they do that. Paul's not even there yet. But Jesus is. And it is already creating in an individual that's going to be a great leader, a collision of cultures, but now even going to go deeper into the culture itself. All right? Paul, in uh, Acts 19, then as we move into 19, this collision of cultures really comes to a head. Paul has been saved. He's a, had a great experience. He has, um, he's got all the knowledge, but he doesn't know Jesus. And now, on the road 
man, he experiences this light in Jesus. He gives his life to Jesus, and then he turns around, and he um, surrenders to him, gives his life to him, and begins to share the gospel to him. He has a whole 180. He's an evangelist. He's a missionary. He's a church planner. He's a leader. He's a shepherd to the community. When we see the beginning of 19, Paul and his team travel to Ephesus. They expose people to the gospel, and the people in turn spread it throughout the world. He addresses some of the very things that, uh, that they just did with Apollos. He talks about the difference between works and grace and Jesus and John, and he just invests in a bunch of people. He meets them, these 12 folks, and he tells them about Jesus, and they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, whole other teaching, whole other conversation, and their life is transformed. We come to verses 8 through 10 up there on the screen, and as this happens, a small group is beginning to be transformed. This collision is beginning to be created even more. It says Paul goes to the synagogue, and he preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively, reasoning about the kingdom of God. But some, this is what happens when we have this clash. Some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. The way is this, this group of Jesus followers. When you surrender your life to Jesus and you begin to invest in that, live it out, it is going to create some of those issues. So Paul, he doesn't even mess around with it. After those months, he leaves the synagogue. He took the believers that were there with him. But here's what's interesting. He doesn't just go to another church. He goes, it says, and hells discussions daily at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He goes to some guy that has this lecture hall where people can present ideas, philosophies, and he presents Jesus. And he does this, it says, for the next two years. He's reasoning with the people. It's hard to even imagine. Man, what is going on? But I will tell you this, it creates some big issues. Paul begins, in these two years, he's performing miracles. God, in his supreme power over all the other gods of the city, is performing miracles. And those first verses in 11 through 22 talk about that. But we pick it up in 13 through 20. It's a crazy story that happens that is encountered in the city when you have two cultures colliding and collisions happening. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. So some people that aren't really following Jesus are taking in this, this whole con crazy world that's going on in Ephesus right now, and they're doing something different with it. They tried, it says, to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying. So they're traveling around. They're using now Jesus' name as some way to make money and cast out spirits without knowing Jesus. And they're saying this, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva are doing this. Sceva's a leading priest, and they're doing this thing, and they're walking around like, hey, there's a demon-possessed man. I don't know if it's like for 50 bucks, we'll cast them out. Hey, in the name of Jesus and Paul, who preaches this, get out. And look at what happens. This is awesome. The next slide. But, <laughs> but one time, when they tried it, this is crazy. The evil spirit, the, the, I know Jesus says to him, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> and then it says, then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from their house. Could you imagine seeing this down the street, naked and battered? Listen, there is a, when, when you give your life to Jesus, really, there is a collision, a crash of culture, of life. It changes things because he wants to change you. It's no joke. It's, it's not an act. It's, it's serious. Well, when this stuff happens, um, in the next set of verses, serious trouble develops in Ephesus concerning the way. There is some big problems. And Demetrius, this guy who is a silversmith, he has a really large business. Because of all the 50 gods, all the crazy stuff going on, he's got a great business for that community, making gods, making little idols, 
making silver things for the people, all the trinkets, and especially to the god Artemis, Diana. He's making some serious cash off these people. And suddenly Paul enters it in and is speaking against all of that. What do you think is going to happen? So Demetrius calls all his bros together. I think that's what he called them. And he says, this is really impacting our employment, how we're making money. We need to do something about this. Let's do something about this. And he gives this little speech in Acts 19, 25 through 27. And what he says is, gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. He's saying what we're doing is a joke, and it's just a way to make money. Well, he just told them it's a way to make money. These handmade gods aren't really gods at all, and he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. See, once Jesus, think about this, it started in Apollos. Once Jesus enters a heart, and that clash happens and transformation happens, I will tell you this. If you follow that path, even in your ups and downs, it does not just impact you. It, am, it should impact everyone around you. It will begin to change your community, your neighborhood, and listen, as it spreads, and as it has for 2,000 years, it changes the world. It changes the world. So it's happened throughout the entire province. This is a problem, he says. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. <laughs> I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence. Ah. And that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. Once you declare that someone is greater and bigger than anything else around you. Once you allow God to release the grit, you know, or let him of your heart on things, and you declare something else is more important than all that, it will create problems. Again, with the money thing, it does that. There is a battle. And this created a big issue. Paul uh, writes um, Ephesians concerning this. Not a problem in the church, but an issue going on um, in the community. He is working through and struggling through that. So he writes Ephesians for that. Um, and so what happens out of this is uh, people's anger boils. These men have gathered together, and they begin shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon what they do, the whole city was filled with confusion, it says. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, and they drag Paul and his companions with them toward that amphitheater. Paul wanted to go in, but the believers said no, but they dragged his friends in. Acts 19.32 says, inside that theater, it's huge. The, the remnants are there today. It sat about 25,000 people. It's giant. People are in there now. It's probably like the game today, but, you know, a little smaller. They're screaming and yelling, great is Artemis. They've dragged people in there. Paul wants to go in and help. They tell him no, and it says they're all shouting um, this one thing with one another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know. <laughs> Listen to that. I don't even know why I'm here. I'm just yelling and screaming. I tell you what, there are times in culture, I just listened to a guy, man, this, this uh, past week in an interview, Richard Dawkins, you know, very famous atheist guy, and it feels like that. I don't even, like, the interview's like, I don't even know what's going on, the interviewer is, but I'm confused, but tell me, what do you, it's just, it creates that. It can create that in you and others. They're yelling and screaming, and uh, they don't even know what they're doing. They do this for about two hours as we move towards the end of Acts 19. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is, and they just keep yelling it, yelling it, yelling it, and finally the mayor comes in. 
The mayor has to come in. He tries for a while to stop them. Finally, he gets their attention, and he says these words in 35 through 40, this other little speech that's given now. Everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and don't do anything rash, you crazy people. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly and then he dismisses everybody. We see this in politics even today. This hasn't changed in 2,000 years. This creates complaints, confusion, challenges, and issues. We see these cultures colliding today. Real quick, here's some quick thoughts um, concerning your notes. I don't want to spend a lot of time because when we get to Ephesians, we're going to go through these again, but more broken down. We're going to see this play out. What collides? What is colliding then and today? One is kingdoms. Two kingdoms are colliding. The kingdom of the world, Satan, and the kingdom of God. That happens in a life, in a community, in a religion. You could say all of it. In a system, kingdoms are colliding. The kingdom of the enemy and your own heart. Man, if you are here today, and you even think that you're maybe ready to give your life to Jesus, I will tell you that there are two kingdoms colliding right now. The kingdom of God and the, the kingdom of the enemy, Satan. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. We see that throughout Scripture. Paul is going to address it in Ephesians. He's going to give us armor to wear, he's going to say, to really a attack, defend a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, and how we deal with the dark kingdom. He's going to talk about that very thing. Dark and light are colliding. The kingdom of your own life is colliding with God. Two belief systems. Religion, faith is colliding. Paul is addressing it. It's not just kingdoms colliding. Kingdoms of money, kingdoms of the heart, kingdoms of politics. But it's also, it, it's also what people believe. For 2,000 years, religion, beliefs, they're colliding. They're coming together. They're at a, a, an attack. What's sad is it happens even in the church. This is where it gets ugly. When maybe the kingdoms that we try to build as leaders collide with God's kingdom that's working out in the community. Or on and on we could go. What does it have to do with, just real quickly, it has to do with power, money, Control. Those three things matter. Power, money, and control. We talked about it last week. When these things collide, control. Who's in control? Who wants to be in control? One of the problems today, for me, maybe for you, is there is always a fight in life for me on who's in control of my life. Me or God. Always a battle. Now, sometimes it's a little more intense than others. But there is a battle for life. Who's in control? And it has to do sometimes with money and power and all those things. When these collide, they create these things. Now, we talked about it a little bit. You saw it in the story. They create confusion. What? Who? Why do I believe? Who am I? One of the things that will happen, we talked about it in the song, when we talk over Ephesians over the coming weeks, and when you surrender your life to Jesus, if you already have, one of the things that you can get confused about is, who am I? Who am I? Who is God? Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a thought. Everybody pulls out my past. Everybody does this. And it's just, you don't know who you are. There's confusion. There's confusion that happens in community sometimes. I was just trying to go to the store on Saturday. And I walked up. Uh, to the front of uh, Thunderbird there. And a guy came up to me. I recognize him. I don't really know him. And he just said these words to me. Grace or works. 
And I went, uh, you know, caught me off guard for a minute. And I, I, I was confused. And I just went, you know, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> and I said, what? I just like, it was like, help, what are you talking about? <laughs> What are you talking about, man? I said, well, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about going to heaven. If, if it ain't by grace, I ain't going. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> but it can create confusion for a lot of you. What do I do? Who am I? What's going on here? It creates, we're going to see throughout Ephesians, but now it's happening 2,000 years later. It creates a commotion. What's going to happen is it's going to disturb the structure of your life. When you give your life to Jesus, the foundation is rocked because you're putting a new foundation in. You're building a different structure around your life. You're going to operate in a different way than what you did before. That is going to create, man, probably some confusion, definitely commotion, and you know what? Number three is some criticism, like Paul got. Charges are brought up against him. How do you handle... And what do I do with criticism? We get it in the church all the time. It's not every week here, but there's always some criticism. Some of it legit and others not. We get it in the church world, right? Criticizing for what we believe, where we stand, what we do, and on and on we could go. The last thing it does is it brings up challenges then. Conflict. This messes with my, as I said, identity, belonging, purpose, and power. And Paul is going to write Ephesians to help us when these things collide. Kingdoms, belief systems, has to do with power, money, control, and what it creates, confusion, commotion, criticism, challenges. How do I go forward? What do I do? And Paul's going to write Ephesians, this letter to a global church, not concerning a problem that the church had, but just to encourage us, strengthen us as followers of him. Because how we live matters. How we live makes a difference. Ephesians 4, 17, and then 20 through 24. This is kind of the guiding thing for us in there. Live, he, Paul's going to say, we'll look at this in weeks, weeks from now, but live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are what? There's one of our words, hopelessly confused. And then he adds these words in 20 through 24. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Some of you, you're learning new things about Jesus, new things based upon his word, and since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. You have a new identity. You're a new person. I know what it's creating as things collide, but you're new. Because that stuff's corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Those are awesome verses to grab a hold of. We're going to look at that later on. Uh, and come back to it. So Paul writes to Ephesians, and he's going to address some things real quickly that just talk about um, the important things of who he is, who we are. When Paul writes Ephesians, he realizes what's colliding, and the main things that are colliding have to do with then, right, identity, who God is and who I am in him, one of our greatest needs, belonging, that together is better, and one of the big themes that he's going to present is unity, unity, unity. Together with, together with, together with, you're going to see it repeated over and over again. As culture is trying to pull you into individualism, he's going to pull us together in oneness. We said that's even going to prove to those around us. This is a demonstration of the gospel. Purpose, he's going to help you with the confusion, who am I? He's going to give you purpose to not only who you are, but why I'm alive and what to do. And he's saying in Ephesians, it's going to be awesome to address all those collisions that we talked about. He's going to say that there is great power, that God is the supreme power, and that he gives you power to do great things that you're called to do. Because one of the things that happens as we collide, we go, I hear what God is calling me to do, but I don't have the power on my own to do it. And Paul would write in Ephesians saying, you don't. Jesus does. God is supreme. He's going to help you. All right. All that's kind of that groundwork um, for us. So here is, then, to pull that all together, three things that I think we must do 
today moving forward throughout the series and in our Christian walk with God. So all that intro leads to this for the series. One, to thrive through a collision of cultures, I need to, one, have a reason. I need to know what I believe. So one of the reasons that Paul, as life is colliding, as he's getting criticized, as people are being yanked into uh, the, the arena, as they're having great challenges, as conflict is creating, one of the things that we as followers of Christ need to do is learn how to reason. We need to know what we believe. So, I told you earlier, you need to join a small group. You need to do other reading. You need to read your Bible for yourself, learn how to do that. We're going to help you with some of these things as we move forward. We need to apply what we're learning. You cannot just go by a feeling. We sang that. What you see, some of it you got to know. So Paul, it says multiple times, and Apollos is helped by others in his life in a small group. It says that they knew how to reason. They don't have all the answers, right? But between God and Google, is that a good principle? I don't know if that's a great, a great one. Really, Ron? You, because that's a nightmare, isn't it? That could be confusing in itself. But man, it is so much simpler today to learn who God is, what you believe, and let us help you and walk together in it. Ask questions, right? We need to learn how to reason, but we also need this. I read this from an, another old monk this past week. We need revelation. So here's reason, what I believe, but now revelation is, who do I believe in? I need to have a revelation of Jesus. Paul, if you go back to the beginning of his life, right, you will see that he learned from the greatest Jewish rabbis. He was smart. He knew the scriptures, but he was also a killer of Christians until he had not only the reasoning, but God took the reasoning and put a revelation of God into his life. He experienced Jesus for himself. And I'm not talking about you trying to create something out of the air or weird stuff. I'm talking about with reason, through the scriptures, with the filter of that, you have a revelation of who God is. You need to know God in relationship. And in turn, take who he is with who he says you are and live that out. That's identity. His identity and yours. Revelation. When we do that, reason and revelation together, the gospel is going to disrupt you, your community, and the culture. Paul had it happen in his life. We need it today. The last thing is this. When I have reason and revelation, I know what I believe, I know who God is, I have great resolve. This is a resolve that says, man, I can move forward with determination despite opposition and suffering. Because many of you are dealing with that. And I, I don't know that this is true. Please, hear me on this. But some of the reasons, not all of the reasons, there are others. Legit, practical, real reasons. But I would declare that some of the reasons why we give up on God, people give up on God, because they don't know what they believe. So the moment something collides with them, they don't know what to do with it. They hear something on a podcast and they turn away and go, right? Whatever it is. So one, you don't, you know why we give up sometimes so early? You don't even know what you believe. I don't want that to sound bad, mean, or guilt you, but it's true. We've got to learn what we believe. Why would I surrender my entire life and keep walking with him no matter what. I know what I believe. Even when I don't feel it and see it. But we also need revelation. Some of the reasons why people will abandon and turn is they are not in a relationship with God, but they know a lot of stuff about him. That's all out throughout scripture. We need reason and revelation of God. So sometimes I'm going to feel it and see it, and sometimes I'm not, 
but my friends around me, my people around me, my tribe around me is going to help me feel it and see it because they're experiencing it and they help lift me up. That gives me resolve. So when I suffer through loss, the past two months have been tough. There's some struggles still going on in life right now. God, where are you? As the psalmist would write, I keep getting up and going again because I know why I believe, what I believe in, and I know who I've given my whole life to. That makes us resilient. Ah, this capability to recover quickly from difficulties. The worship team can come. Paul, in the end, with that, he's going to give a great speech. As they're getting ready, we're going to do these things. We're going to, uh, in a minute, just take communion. Then we're going to uh, sing a song during communion. And then we're going to go out there, and they're going to go change the world and watch the Super Bowl at the same time. You could do I get it, all right? But Paul, he gives this great speech in Acts 20. He says, you, he tells the people after all this, he says, you won't see me again, but I've been faithful. He even says in there, you can read it in 20, if, uh, if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. I did what I was supposed to do. I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants me to do. I, I want you to guard yourselves. There's going to be people that try to trap you and get you, false teachers, even in your own ranks that are going to turn on you. He says, I've worked hard for this, so I entrust you to God. And I want to read, it's like in this, this chunk of verses, 18 through 24 of chapter 20, actually, not 30, but in chapter 20, it's like Paul is the gladiator, the Spartan. I mean, I dig this. He's the, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, whatever, the Irishman. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know why it's slipping me. Braveheart right? So women, I'm sorry. You may feel that too, but I don't know. There's something about this, this part. Look at what he says. He does it. What we have, image of Paul, it may not be so exciting, but I have in my mind him on a horse or something, you know, riding around. He calls the elders from Ephesus together. You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia, Ephesus, until now, I've done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I've endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. We read about it. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, everybody, the same message, the necessity of repenting from sin, turning to God, and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in the city, after city, that jail and suffering lie ahead of me. But my life, and I would say because he has reason and a revelation, he has great resolve, and he says these words, my life is worth nothing unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. He stops. He kneels with his brothers. They are in tears, and they're partly in tears because they know they won't see him again. He leaves. He ends up in Rome, and he writes the book of Ephesians. He does it no matter what happens to him. He's beaten, shipwrecked, all crazy things happen to him. And he does it all because his life was changed. When one day on a road, two cultures collided, and he chose Jesus. And not only his life changed, but he changed lives forever. Stand with me, will you? Father, thank you. As we enter into this whole season, some context to what we're learning, as we see the cultures of life collide 2,000 years ago in Ephesus. And they collided because 
you sent your son Jesus to earth so that people could have a transformed life and that transformed life came and when he Jesus died on the cross for our sins we could not save ourselves we could not fix it ourselves we needed a savior so many of us in here today online listening later we believe that the only way to have this life that God speaks of throughout Scripture that many of us experience is to accept Jesus as our Savior what he's done on the cross paid a price for our sin that works could not accomplish only grace could and because of that death on the cross he was buried but he didn't stay in the grave he rose from the grave so we can raise from death as well we can go from darkness to light because of what you've done for us Jesus thank you many of us here need reason to know what we believe but we also need revelation to know who you are so as we journey together may we discover even more of those two things some of us today need great resolve for anyone God that maybe has a bunch of like logic down and facts down and reasoning down give them a revelation of you for many in here that have had a revelation of you and experience with you it may feel good once in a while they also maybe need some reasoning man some some truth in their life God but we even need those two things to collide together so we can be all that you've called us to be and if someone is here today and they are ready to surrender their life to you I pray that their prayer is simply Jesus I surrender my life to you in Jesus name